largest bankruptcy of all times, Lehman Brothers. This hearing was previously set for early October and had to be rescheduled today. Ten years ago, Lehman Brothers filed courts. Our bankruptcy system wasn't equipped to handle the resolution of large financial institutions like Lehman. In fact, certain bankruptcy provisions enacted Dodd-Frank. It created an agency-driven process similar to the FDIC's existing bank resolution process. In addition, the Dodd-Frank Act called for an examination of how to improve the bankruptcy code to better handle large financial institutions. As a result, uh, experts from financial, regulatory, legal, and academic community, communities, including those on the panel, sought a solution to better equip our bankruptcy laws to resolve failing institutions. Their goal was to encourage greater self-policing in order to reduce the likelihood of another financial crisis and el eliminate the possibility of using taxpayers' dollars to bail out uh, failing institutions. These exhaustive efforts resulted in a proposal to create an entirely new Chapter 14 within the bankruptcy code to enhance the prospects of an efficient and efficient resolution of a financial institution through bankruptcy process. Over the past several Congresses, the proposal has been incorporated into bills introduced in both the Senate and the House. Senators Cornyn and Toomey introduced legislation during the 113th and 114th Congresses. The House has introduced and passed similar legislation on a standalone basis three times by unanimous voice vote in the other body. I want to thank the witnesses for their efforts on this important topic. I look forward to hearing about how the layman bankruptcy exposed problems within the bankruptcy system and how the Chapter 14 proposal would address those problems. We need, however, to ensure a more consistent approach to this process that minimizes a, uh, the impact of future financial crisis and keeps taxpayers off the hook. I'll now call on Senator Coons. Thank you, Chairman Grassley, and thank you, um, yep. Senator Cornyn. Um, thank you to the panel. Um, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to consider this a complex and difficult issue together. Uh, a decade ago, after the worst recession since the Great Depression, Congress passed groundbreaking Wall Street reforms to try and prevent another financial crisis and another large taxpayer-funded bailout. Um, Dodd-Frank took critical steps to stop abuse, to limit reckless risk-taking, to avoid future taxpayer bailouts, and strengthen oversight of our nation's complex financial system. Uh, I believe it's critical we continue to work together to secure and build upon these important reforms. Uh, I look forward to talking today about proposals to add a new chapter to the bankruptcy code, the proposed chapter 14, something called enhanced bankruptcy, um, specifically to facilitate the ability of a large complex financial institution to go through the bankruptcy process. Uh, this is a very complicated issue. There is uncertainty as to whether a Chapter 14 reorganization could, in fact, be successful. Um, and there are concerns among some quarters that passing enhanced bankruptcy could be the first step towards a repeal of Dodd-Frank. So let me be clear about my views. As a senator from Delaware, uh, I have witnessed at close range the ways in which our bankruptcy courts can facilitate uh, the rapid and orderly reorganization of a troubled company, especially a very large and very complex company, so that it comes out the other side saving value and jobs for our economy. Um, I feel strongly that repealing Dodd-Frank would be a dangerous step backward for the safety and soundness of our markets and for our nation's economic security. An important part of any discussion about Chapter 14 should be the interplay between enhanced bankruptcy, regulators and their role, and the Title II orderly liquidation authority that Dodd-Frank provides. I appreciate Senator Cornyn and uh, Chairman Grassley and their staffs for discussing these issues with me and my staff. Uh, I appreciate their willingness to consider revisions to uh, previous Chapter 14 bills that have passed the House with broad support, including improvements that would make clear the bill is a complement to Dodd-Frank rather than intended to replace Title II and to tighten uh, liability language and increase regulators' involvement. 
Um, we have an excellent panel before us today with significant expertise in these proposals. Uh, and I look forward to the insights you will bear as we try to finalize any proposal uh, on Chapter 14 for this Congress. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You. Our first witness. Did you want to make an opening statement? Oh, go ahead. If you want to make an opening statement. Did, did you want an opening statement, too? Okay, go ahead. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since, since um, I've been somewhat involved in this issue for a few few years now, I wanted to just add a few words. I, I agree with the characterization of um, Senator Coons. He and I have had a lot of discussions about this. We may have um, had different ideas about Dodd-Frank, but uh, frankly, this is a, a reform that's limited in scope, but one that I think is important to uh, restore uh, due process and transparency and some regular order um, as opposed to leaving this uh, uh, issue for the administrative state with a lot of discretion uh, and few rules uh, to really guide its hand. So that's uh, why I introduced originally with Senator Toomey a piece of legislation. This actually represents a pared down version which is designed to try to build consensus. That's actually what we try to do around here. Uh, at least I think we should try to do more of. And uh, this is an important policy issue uh, that would of course, enable financial institutions to voluntarily recapitalize and avoid total collapse uh, along with the attendant damage to consumers and, and, and taxpayers. So I appreciate Chairman Grassley, you're holding this hearing so we can talk about Chapter 14. We've learned from the experiences of 2008, and we're not so foolish just to presume that the market will always be as robust as it is today. So we have to prepare for the future. And even as we enjoy these days of of prosperity. So thank you for holding the hearing and uh, I'll pass it back to you. Okay. Our first witness is Don Bernstein. Uh, he is a partner at law firm Davis Polk and chairman of the restructuring group. He is a former chair of the National Bankruptcy Conference and served as a commissioner on the American Bankruptcy Commission and director of the American College of Bankruptcy. Uh, Mr. Bernstein earned his law degree from the University of Chicago and a bachelor's degree from Princeton. Mark Rowe is professor uh, under the title David Berg, professor of law at Harvard Law School. He teaches corporate law and corporate bankruptcy and has written extensively on both topics. Professor Rowe earned his law degree from Harvard Law School and a bachelor's degree from Columbia. Mr. Hessler is a partner at the law firm of Kirkland and Ellis, specializing in bankruptcy and restructuring. He also teaches a restructuring class each fall at the University of Pennsylvania and co-founded the University of Pennsylvania Institute for Restructuring Studies. He earned his law degree and bachelor's degree from the University of Michigan. We'll start with Mr. Bernstein. Is the, the, the red light is... Yep, there we go. Yeah. So this is an exceedingly important topic, and, and I think um, I just want to start out by saying I was at the Fed the weekend that Lehman Brothers failed, representing one of the other financial institutions, and it was a scary thing. And what occurred after that just got scarier and scarier over the next few days and the ensuing months, and, and we've been recovering from that since that time. So I want to thank the committee for taking up this bill and thinking about these problems because they, they, they are important to resolve. Um, I'm going to focus on two things, really. First of all, the lessons that we should have learned from Lehman Brothers, and secondly, the implications of those lessons for uh, the Chapter 14 bill. Um, you will recall that the unplanned bankruptcy of Lehman uh, was preceded by a severe run on the liquidity of Lehman Brothers, as, as is typical with most financial firms. It's the run on liquidity that forces them into bankruptcy. Uh, there was a weekend attempt at a private sector rescue, which failed, and the bankruptcy proceedings commenced on a Sunday night. Um, Lehman then uh, was forced to face uh, the closeout of all of its uh, financial contracts 
which meant the collateral got dumped on the market, which depressed market prices. And when market prices were depressed, that affected other financial institutions and the fear that similar, something similar was going to happen to the other financial institutions. Um, and of course, that created a potential for a run on other financial institutions, which, wa which ended up leading to the governmental intervention uh, with respect to the rest of the economy. Um, so uh, the, the abrupt unraveling of Lehman uh, forced us to focus on the fact that we need to find a different way of resolving financial firms uh, rather than a meltdown liquidation of the kind that we had in Lehman Brothers. Um, we have to do it. We have to find a way of doing it without requiring taxpayer funds. And so uh, since the uh, bankruptcy of Lehman, uh, uh, the regulators, the financial firms, and pursuant to Dodd-Frank, um, uh, 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 the, the, the entire financial community has been looking at different ways of solving the problem. And the way that people have thought about this is the way we think about a typical Chapter 11 case. In Chapter 11, while it is a relatively slow, laborious process, we have private sector creditors and shareholders absorb the losses of the firm, and the firm gets reorganized and continues in business. That a structure can be extrapolated to a financial institution, but financial institutions have this unique feature, which is they're in the business of maturity transformation, which means that it's very easy for their cash to get depleted. They, uh, maturity transformation is a process where they take in deposits from depositors, which are short-term obligations of the, of, the, of the bank, but then they turn them into long-term assets like real estate mortgages. You all remember the great scene from the Frank Capra movie, It's a Wonderful Life, where there's a run on the bank. And uh, what happens there is he closes, uh, Jimmy Stewart closes the door and says, your money's in that person's house. You don't want to foreclose on their house. Well, the problem is that except for a tiny institution like the building and loan, you can't do that with a big financial institution. So it happens too quickly. And you have to figure out if you're going to do this recapitalization approach and make the firm continue in business and have the private sector absorb the losses, how to do it very fast, how to do it very quickly. Um, uh, so uh, the regulators uh, under Title II of Dodd-Frank, Orderly Liquidation Authority, and the firms uh, who are required to do resolution plans under the bankruptcy code under Title I of Dodd-Frank worked for the last few years on developing what's called the single point of entry approach to resolution. The, I'm almost out of my time. The, the benefit that, that we have in our financial structure is that banks have holding companies. And holding companies issue equity and debt. And if you can take the, that debt and restructure it as equity, you've effectively recapitalized the financial institution. And what the Chapter 14 bill it does is it creates a mechanism for doing that by putting the holding company into Chapter 11. Those debts are suspended. They are subject to the automatic stay in bankruptcy. And then the bankruptcy court literally over a weekend, can take the stock of the subsidiaries and transfer them to a new debt-free bank holding company. And by doing that, you've effectively recapitalized the firm, you've left the old debt behind, and the subsidiaries, the bank, the broker-dealer, all the regulators' subsidiaries, are then owned by a trust for the benefit of the bankruptcy estate, and the trustee, over time, monetizes that asset uh, and can return value to the creditors of the holding company. Uh, the beauty of this structure is that it honors specifically the priorities that are in place because the creditors of the operating companies have priority by virtue of the fact that they've extended credit down at the bank level or at the broker deal level, not at the holding company level. The holding company creditors only have access to the equity of the subsidiaries by law. So they can wait in line for the value to be realized. And in fact, unlike Lehman Brothers, where the meltdown liquidation created losses that wouldn't have occurred had the company remained a going concern, those creditors at the holding company level can benefit from the incremental value that's created by not having to liquidate the subsidiaries, not have their derivative contracts close out and the like. So everybody benefits here. The operating company creditors, the employee 
employees, the trade, the um, uh, uh, counterparties on contracts, the depositors get paid if this works, and the holding company creditors have equity value that they can then realize where that equity value, as in Lehman Brothers, might be destroyed entirely by a meltdown liquidation of the subsidiaries. Um, I have a few specific comments on some other matters, but if you want, I can defer to the other speakers, and in response to questions, I can, I can provide additional information. Thank you very much. Professor Rohl. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to talk about uh, bankruptcy for financial institutions. Um, I thought I'd give some global comments first and then some specifics for, uh, for the Chapter 14 proposal we're thinking about. So that this Chapter 14 proposal is a means to turn a very big issuance of debt into equity when it's most needed, when the company is in stress, um, and the goal is to turn it into equity over a weekend. Um, this is a useful option to have. Um, it's not a full-scale, broad bankruptcy reorganization, um, the kind of mechanism we ultimately deserve, maybe sometime, uh, sometime in the future. It's an, it's an effort at an incremental, uh, incremental improvement, um, and I want to emphasize some of the incrementalness for some other purposes later. So some very big picture uh, aspects, um, uh, things that we're probably not going to, that we're not going to cure right now. Um, the need for this Chapter 14 is implicitly telling us that we probably still don't have enough equity in the financial system. We've got a lot more equity in the financial system in 2018 than we had in 2008. Uh, but the goal here is to turn equity uh, debt of approximately the same size as the equity we have into weekend equity, um, and that's laudable, um, but it's kind of telling us that uh, we're still not at the safe level of equity that, uh, that, we, um, that we deserve. Um, and uh, uh, the, the reason to go forward with this kind of a Chapter 14 proposal is the sensibility that we're not going to get to the level of equity that, uh, that would uh, really be safest, so we've got to do with a, uh, with a second best. Um, second global aspect uh, emphasized by Senator Coons in his remarks, um, we want to be on guard that um, it creates an atmosphere by which prudential regulation uh, could be cut elsewhere. That is, if there's a false belief that we've got a very robust bankruptcy channel as opposed to something that's going to be useful in some important circumstances, but limited circumstances, uh, we run the risk um, that regulators or people who talk to regulators um, uh, say, we don't really need this kind of a capital requirement. We don't need this prudential regulation because we've got, uh, we've got a bankruptcy system. Uh, Chapter 14 and repeal of Title II were previously linked. Uh, they seem to have become unlinked, um, and uh, that's one of the reasons I think we, uh, we should feel comfortable going forward. But if someone concludes that future linkage is high, um, then they should be skeptical about the, uh, about the bill. Um, third and last uh, global picture is the, the reason we're in a pickle here um, is fundamentally the new finance of repos and derivatives. Um, they've obtained some significant bankruptcy incentives that do allow them to run off and potentially kill a tottering institution in ways that other creditors uh, in a bankruptcy proceeding, um, uh, proceeding can't. In a typical bankruptcy, uh, the bankruptcy rule enjoins creditors from running and dumping collateral at the very beginning of a proceeding. For the repos and, and uh, derivatives counterparties, those rules are turned off, um, and they can run and dump collateral imme uh, immediately. Um, these are now gigantic markets, um, and we're dealing with these problems um, created by repos and derivatives by, in some sense, making it more assured in this bill and other things that this um, hot money will be paid in full in the bankruptcy, in the bankruptcy proceeding. Um, if I had my druthers on this, part of the reform would narrow the protected category. The best narrowing for repo would be in mortgage-backed securities. Um, the American housing market, and this is just the facts of life of American finance, uh, suffers from booms and busts. Um, mortgage-backed security repos fundamentally turns 30-year mortgages into overnight demand deposits, which run when there's a problem. Um, if they're not as favored as other financing channels, uh, we'll get more money flowing through the safer channels. 
Um, and the bankruptcy code now treats mortgage-backed securities um, as uh, with the same level of safety that uh, it treats U.S. Treasuries. Uh, the repo rules are great for U.S. Treasuries. Um, we've paid some price for them being applied to, uh, to uh, mortgage-backed securities. So in 2008, a housing bubble burst. Um, it hit the financial sector like a tsunami, um, and a broad portion of this tsunami was in mortgage-backed securities. Um, it couldn't have hit so hard if they did not have um, the broad-based bankruptcy exceptions that, uh, that, they, uh, that they have. Um, this, in my view, in retrospect, was, uh, was a mistake, um, and it would be good if sometime we get it on the agenda to correct it. Um, if I can take another minute or two, I can focus on some of the specifics of the, of the bill. Um, first, take, an, uh, take another minute. Okay. Uh, so first observation, um, the bill contemplates a recapitalization over a weekend, um, and if the repo creditors don't run when the bank reopens on Monday, this is great. It's worked, and it's the reason for my uh, support, qualified though it is, for the effort. Um, but we really have to be realistic. Um, it may fail. Uh, the counterparties may run on Monday anyway. Um, and there are multiple reasons. I put some of them into the uh, written testimony. Difficulty is if they run on Monday and the bank becomes unstable by the end of the day on Monday and has failed again, um, there's no obvious mechanism to turn the failed bank over to the FDIC for a Title II proceeding. Uh, so the usual thinking here is, well, if bankruptcy fails, we'll move it over into Title II and the FDIC will pick it up. Um, the risk, if we don't think more about this, is that we'll have made what's really a difficult task for the FDIC, if they were dealing with it on Friday afternoon, a nearly impossible task on Monday afternoon. Um, in the written testimony, I outlined some of what we need to start thinking about. Um, there are some other reasons why it, uh, why it, might, uh, why it might fail. Um, let me close with uh, one admonition. Um, the bill's title, the draft that I saw, um, has a title along the lines of um, a, a bill to, uh, to provide for the liquidation, reorganization, or recapitalization of. Um, I suggest delete liquidation. It's not providing for liquidation. It's providing one mechanism, a recapitalization mechanism. Um, and for some institutions, we do want to liquidate. For some institutions, we do want to reorganize. Um, but we should be clear that we're doing one thing which we hope will be useful in a, uh, in a, uh, in a financial crisis. Or alternatively, upgrade the statute to match the aspirations of the title. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Now, Mr. Hessler. Chairman Grassley and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify at today's hearing. As mentioned into your uh, generous introductory remarks, I spend most of my time representing major corporations as company counsel in very large and challenging Chapter 11 cases. Uh, it is a privilege to appear before the committee today in support of Chapter 14. I also was pleased to testify before the House Judiciary Committee three times in support of the substantively identical House legislation known as FIBA, which, as noted, has passed the House Judiciary Committee and full House multiple times. Given the comprehensive record scrutinizing FIBA and thus Chapter 14, I will not repeat my prior written and oral testimonies, and I will instead focus today on two key issues. The first is the federal government's ability to file an involuntary Chapter, 11, or Chapter 14 case. Um, earlier versions of FIBA expressly allowed the federal government to file an involuntary case without the covered financial corporation's consent. I and others have testified this grant of authority was an unnecessary and unhelpful distraction, and the versions of FIBA that passed the House in April 2016 and April 2017 did not include this provision. That said, the present version of proposed Chapter 14 does provide for an involuntary filing right for approximately eight to 10 so-called globally systemically important bank holding companies, also known as GSIBs. While I remain skeptical of this grant of authority, it is hardly a fatal flaw for Chapter 14, given I believe it is exceedingly remote the involuntary filing right would ever actually be exercised. And this issue, I do not think, should be an impediment to Chapter 14's passage. Um, the federal government, either through even only the threat of a Title II proceeding, or its other general regulatory powers already has sufficient influence to essentially compel a covered financial corporation to commence a voluntary Chapter 11 case. And regardless of whether Title II remains in place or whether Chapter 14 ultimately provides the involuntary filing right, 
again, it is massively unlikely there would ever be an involuntary case. As a GSIB's day of reckoning gets closer, an insolvent GSIB already would be in active negotiations with its key creditor and other constituencies over the timing and necessity of a potential filing. And, it, and that GSIB will be highly motivated to begin a voluntary case before any creditor or regulator is able to commence an involuntary proceeding. Chapter 14 itself reflects this commercial reality by requiring pre-filing notice and coordination between a potential debtor and the administrative office of the U.S. courts and the chief judge of the Court of Appeals of the district where the case may be filed. The second issue I want to address in my live testimony is the likely interplay between Chapter 14 and Title II. In this context as well, any ongoing debate over Title II's viability or continuation should not impede the prospects for Chapter 14's enactment. Assuming Title II does remain, the, avail the availability of Chapter 14's provisions actually would make it far less likely that Title II ever will be invoked, which is consistent with Congress's intent, as expressly stated within Title II itself, to use the bankruptcy code's reorganization powers first and only to have a regulatory liquidation process as a last resort. And while Chapter 14 is a needed and beneficial bankruptcy reform regardless of Title II, any uncertainty as to Title II, I believe, makes Chapter 14's adoption even more essential. This is because the analytical framework for evaluating Chapter 14 should not be as a standalone proposal, but rather Chapter 14 as compared to the other SIFI insolvency resolution regimes, namely Chapter 11 in its current form, Chapter 11 as amended by Chapter 14, and Title II. Among those alternatives, I believe chapter, four needs, chapter 14 is the best designed option, both structurally and philosophically, to advance the private and public policies that animate the reorganization of a failing bank. My written testimony examined at length the varying, the varying incentives these available restructuring options present for debtors, creditors, and regulators. Given time constraints, I'm just going to highlight here one issue which I think perhaps may be most significant, which is Chapter 14's proposed treatment of director and officer liability under Section 1403D. This exculpation provision understandably may prompt some to question whether Chapter 14 is improperly shielding directors and officers from potential liability for their actions or inactions. In my view, for the following reasons, this provision is highly justifiable, and there's three reasons I'll go through quickly. First, in my experience representing large Chapter 11 debtors, the knowledge, expertise, and commitment of the company's pre-petition directors and officers are indispensable to effectuating a soft landing into an orderly passage through bankruptcy. Chapter 14 incentivizes such conduct by removing the specter of legal liability for actions taken as responsible fiduciaries. Second, the scope and language of Section 1403D are very appropriately limited. The only board decisions that are protected from potential liability are for a, quote, good faith filing and for, quote, any reasonable action taken in the filing or asset transfer decision. If it can be shown that the challenged actions were taken in bad faith or were unreasonable, the board can and should be held liable. The final reason to mention very quickly is Chapter 14 does not supplant any existing remedies, both under the bankruptcy code or otherwise applicable law for any board malfeasance. Any legally cognizable director and officer misconduct should be prosecutable to the fullest extent of the law. And Chapter 14 in no way impedes the ability of law enforcement or other, uh, or other interested parties to hold directors and officers appropriately accountable. Uh, in sum, of the existing potential, uh, the existing and potential resolution regimes, I believe Chapter 14 is most likely to maximize the state value for the benefit of stakeholders while safeguarding against broader economic contagion that could result from the unmitigated failure of a SIFI. I look forward to further careful consideration of the important issues addressed by 14. I thank the committee for allowing me to share my views, and I welcome the opportunity to answer any questions. Yeah. I should go now, but I'm going to ask one question of you, Mr. Hessler. And it comes from the fact that 10 or 11 years ago, when we were using taxpayers' money, and these executives were getting bonuses, at the time, it was very hard to explain to our taxpayers. In fact, I couldn't explain it. So how does Chapter 14 ensure that executives do not inappropriately funnel money to themselves right before bankruptcy? Are there tools already in the bankruptcy code to address that concern? Yeah, yes, Chairman Grassley, two, two points in response to that. First, um, given the passage of Dodd-Frank, 
bailouts are now ostensibly prohibited. So taxpayer money could not be actually uh, used to bail out a, a failing bank. And certainly, therefore, it follows no taxpayer money could be used for the purposes of paying executive bonuses. Even assuming otherwise, there are provisions in the bankruptcy code that provide for the clawback of compensation to insiders if it was improperly provided. These are known as avoidance actions, and there are specific provisions of the code that apply to insiders of a corporation, which are the top executives. So the bankruptcy code already includes existing powers to claw back any improperly paid uh, compensation. Okay, Senator Corner. I'll, defer, I'll uh, follow <laughs> Senator Coon. Um, thank you, um, Senator Corner and Chairman Grassley. I'd just be interested first in hearing from all three of you, if I might, that um, whether or not uh, Chapter 14 enhanced bankruptcy is a complement uh, to Title II, to Dodd-Frank's uh, orderly liquidation authority, or a replacement for it, is it possible for it to be um, a constructive and useful complement? I, huh? uh, I, I will go first. Uh, I, it is definitely a complement. Uh, this is, uh, you know, one of, one of the things we have to grapple with here is that there's no perfect resolution regime. Uh, there is no perfect resolution regime, and having two arrows in your quiver is exceedingly important. This is especially so because foreign regulators are looking at the U.S. They know the U.S. regulators, and they know that the U.S. regulators can stand ready as a second line of defense to uh, move in if something is needed. So uh, we think that, I think that's exceedingly important. In addition, uh, a lot of uh, what we're doing here is trying to restore confidence in an institution that was distressed. And one of the things that gives the market confidence is that the regulators can act if they have to, uh, if the Chapter 11 bankruptcy, if the Chapter 14 bankruptcy fails. So I think all of those reasons are supportive, and I think the, the Treasury reached the same conclusion in its recent report on why Chapter 14 and Title II can coexist. Professor Rome, thank you. Uh, I would also say that uh, Title II is a complement for, uh, for, uh, for Chapter 14 and vice, uh, vice versa. Um, one point that uh, Don has made and another point that I'd like to add, uh, it's not clear that Chapter 14 can work without Title II. Um, two dimensions. One that Don has mentioned, for a global financial institution, uh, one of our facts of international life is uh, foreign regulators tend to mistrust bankruptcy courts. Um, part of the reason is their bankruptcy courts do not work as well as our bankruptcy courts do. Um, part of it um, is uh, they just like to sit down with the regulator and let uh, their absent, no, abs, uh, opposite number and thrash it out. Um, there's a second reason why we need Title II to make Chapter 14 work. Um, we're asking the judge to do a lot over 48 hours, um, and the judge has to make some determinations about the debt that de facto is going to be turned into equity in 48 hours. Uh, the judge will be in a much better position to make those uh, decisions if the regulator has previously looked at the debt um, and is a position in those 48 hours to be able to testify uh, to the judge this debt meets the requirements that we need to turn it into effectively equity within the 48, uh, 48 hours. Um, it'll be difficult for a Chapter 14 proceeding like we have um, here and maybe any Chapter 14 proceeding that we can imagine uh, without it being uh, prearranged in some ways by, uh, by Title II. Thank you. Mr. Hester. Uh, I would agree that it's a compliment, um, and for a few reasons. Uh, first, as I testified. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I was saying I agree that it is a compliment. Um, as I testified, the, the threat of a Title II proceeding actually significant enhances the likelihood that Chapter 14 would be used. So having Title II there as a regulatory backup threat actually, I think, probably makes Chapter 14 even more likely. Um, I would mention also that just in the context of Chapter 11 alone, not for the purposes of SIFIs, there are other types of resolution regimes at issue. There are state law reorganization options. There's a, uh, there's a tactic known as the assignment for benefit of creditors. But there's a reason why Chapter 11 is overwhelmingly the most utilized reorganization regime. And it's because it has been over time refined that it's the most effective and it's the best available option. So Chapter 11 itself is a complement to other reorganization options. But because it is the most effective, that's why it gets used most often. I would mention, I think that's the, the hallmark of Chapter 14, is it takes the best elements of Chapter 11, the most effective elements of Chapter 11, but then it also adds 
the additional mechanisms that are necessary to account for the exigencies of a major bank failure. Let me, let me just follow up on that if I could, because some have questioned the need for a specific Chapter 14. What are the benefits uh, the bankruptcy system can uh, provide when dealing with a company in crisis, and why a specific chapter for large and complex financial institutions, and would it promote the stability of the financial system overall? I, I, I think it would, if I can go first. I think the, the, the key mechanism that is incorporated by Chapter 14 is what's described as a single point of entry. Mm -hmm. And Don talked about it in his opening comments, and it's, we've all addressed it at length in our, in our testimony. Theoretically, what Chapter 14 codifies could be accomplished under Chapter 11, and arguably it was accomplished with the Lehman Brothers. But it had to be done on the fly, and it didn't have all of the specification, which led to a certain amount of the chaos and disruption that occurred at the beginning of Lehman Brothers. So what Chapter 14 is doing is basically um, it's crystallizing and catalyzing what could otherwise occur, but provides very helpful clarity for the court and for the debtor and for other stakeholders as to how it can happen most effectively and efficiently. I mean, one last question, Professor Rowe, if I might. Uh, what's your view of the inclusion of an involuntary petition option in Chapter 14 that would allow regulators uh, to compel the commencement of a Chapter 14 bankruptcy proceeding? If the petition is voluntarily filed by the company, is it your view the regulators should still be involved in a Chapter 14 proceeding as well? Uh, so on the, on the first question, uh, I do think it's important that the regulator have authority to file the, uh, the involuntary. Um, not so much that the regulator will actually ever file an involuntary. Um, as has been mentioned, uh, there's so much that the banking regulators um, have that if they wanted to force a, a voluntary filing, um, they could. They might have to give something up. Uh, they might have to give something up in timing. They might have to give something up in some negotiation of some terms, depending on the circumstances. Um, this makes it uh, clearer that uh, if the relevant regulator concludes that the, the financial stability of the United States uh, needs to see this filing happen, um, the regulator can turn to uh, the, uh, the, the financial institution and say, uh, you're going to file um, uh, Friday afternoon. Either you do it voluntarily, uh, which is normally should be the preference, um, or it'll happen involuntarily. It's also critical in coordination with uh, foreign regulators. If it's an institution that has significant business in Tokyo, London, or Bonn, there's going to have to be some pre-coordination with the foreign regulators. Um, and in terms of credibility, if the Federal Reserve is talking to the foreign regulators and the foreign regulators say, how do you know there's going to be a filing on Friday? You have no authority here. Uh, you've been um, uh, cut down in this process. That reduces the possibility that the American regulator can get things coordinated so that um, assets won't be ring fest abroad. Thank you. Thank you to the panel. Thank you. Well, thank you to all three of you for uh, lending us your expertise in trying to figure this out. I would say that this does represent an incremental change in the law, uh, Professor Rowe. That's what Senator Coons and I discussed, and that's why this is different from what Senator Toomey and I previously have proposed because we're trying to make some incremental changes here, but those that I think will hopefully benefit uh, the public and uh, particularly consumers who might see uh, themselves wiped out in the process of a disorderly uh, resolution. Uh, Mr. Bernstein, you mentioned a, a number of benefits of the of Chapter 14 as compared to what happened in Lehman Brothers. Um, you would call that a hard landing, wouldn't you? Yeah, Le Lehman Brothers was a hard landing. So this uh, I, we're talking about, do you want a hard landing or a soft landing? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And let me, let me just go through a couple of them, and you can supplement it or correct me if I misstate it. You said one of the benefits of Chapter 14 would be the automatic stay, which would maintain the status quo, prevent a run on the bank while the bankruptcy court was working its way uh, through all of this. You mentioned the priorities by which creditors are paid, and uh, those are statutory, are they not? That is correct. As opposed to an ad hoc or um, exercise of broad discretion by the FDIC or, or Federal Reserve. That's correct. And you also mentioned, uh, we, we discussed, uh, uh, Professor Rowe, Mr. Hessler, talked about the incentives for voluntary action and whether, as a result of Chapter 14, that everybody involved 
Um, I know we talk, like to talk about win-wins. We like to discuss win-wins around here, but they're few and far between. But would you consider Chapter 14 a, way, uh, a process by which the incentives for voluntary action benefit everybody involved in one of these uh, resolutions? Yes, I would. And may I elaborate on that a little bit? Um, I, the prospect of a meltdown liquidation is one of the disincentives for a board to commence ordinary bankruptcy proceedings. And if you don't have a hard, a hard uh, stop process, if you actually have a reorganization process, it preserves value for everybody, including the creditors of the holding company, as I mentioned in my testimony. So I do think it's a win-win, and I think it is more likely that it will be a voluntary process. Professor Rowe, would you care to comment on that part of it? Mr. Hessler. Do you have any, uh, anything you'd like to add on? I was just trying to compare with, between the hard and the soft landing. Yeah. And, and to me, as a recovering lawyer and recovering state court judge, I like the idea of irregularity, predictability in terms of the rules, neutral rules that would apply to every case as opposed to the discretion that might otherwise be involved where statutory priorities wouldn't necessarily be honored and other, um, other concerns like that. Yeah, just the, the two pieces that I would add to that. The first of all, with regard to the statutory priorities, it's, it's been noted multiple times in my testimony and elsewhere. Uh, Title II of Dodd-Frank explicitly provides the federal government the ability to depart from established priorities and to treat similarly situated creditors dissimilarly. So the prospect of a Title II proceeding, I actually think, leads to market confusion. And I think it makes it more difficult to main sta maintain stability amongst investors and to banks. Um, Chapter 14 would otherwise adhere to Chapter 11's established priorities, which are very, very well established and very well understood by investors. The second piece I want to expand on quickly is you mentioned uh, with regard to the automatic stay for these qualified financial contracts. I have heard uh, Chapter 14 criticized on the grounds that well, only 48 hours is not enough time for the stay to be in place for the qualified financial contracts, but I think it's critical not to view this as a standalone proposal because under Chapter 11, currently, there's no automatic stay for the qualified financial contracts. So Chapter 14 provides more protection than Chapter 11. And importantly, Title II, the automatic stay for the QFCs is, is only up to 48 hours. So while it may be a valid criticism under 14 that perhaps that stay should be longer, it's at least as robust, if not greater, protection than otherwise exists under Chapter 11 and Title II. Under existing bankruptcy law, is it possible for a bankrupt a company to declare bankruptcy under Chapter 11? and the consumers who interact with that uh, company not notice any real difference in the way they're being treated? In other words, it, it's, it maintains the ability to continue the business in place uh, without disruption, correct? I, I think the most telling example of that is every major airline has been through bankruptcy at least one, right. and people still get on those airplanes and fly. And to the, yet you would think that, you know, to the extent that there's massive concern about the stability of the business, that's probably the starkest example that Chapter 11 does not erode consumer confidence. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you. Uh, first, um, an observation. One of the frustrating things about having to go through the experience of the 2018, 2008 mortgage meltdown was that it was not only foreseeable, it was foreseen and uh, the warnings went unheeded. And um, we are now in a situation in which other warnings are going unheeded. The Bank of England, as a financial regulator, and numerous peer-reviewed economics papers are warning of the uh, potential economic catastrophe, uh, catastrophe of a carbon asset bubble collapse. And Freddie Mac and uh, insurance company publications and the Union of Concerned Scientists are a warning of a coastal property value collapse, which we may actually be in the early stages of. So we seem to be in the business around here of ignoring warnings of potential economic hazards. Um, and I'd like to ask unanimous consent that uh, two documents, numerous experts are warning of the risks of a carbon bubble, and numerous experts are warning of a separate crash uh, for coastal real estate be put into the record. Without objection. Um, my question has to do with deferred compensation. Uh, Mr. Bernstein, you are one of the country's leading experts on bankruptcy. These questions, I think, will be very easy uh, to you. Um, first of all, deferred compensation is a tactic for highly compensated individuals to reduce their tax liability by staging the point at which their income is reflected uh, in taxes, correct? Uh, that's one of, the, one of the purposes of it, yes. 
and it um, becomes an obligation of the company to pay back those that is correct amounts that are deferred compensation and the obligation to for the company to pay back those highly compensated individuals the deferred compensation that they used likely for tax advantage is a general unsecured claim of such a company in bankruptcy, is it not? That's correct, except to the extent of the limited employee priority. Correct. And the um, outcome of the uh, unsecured claim in a bankruptcy is virtually certainly less than 100% likelihood of payment, correct? It varies, but if the company's insolvent, it won't be paid in full. Yeah, and it might even be zero. Could be zero. And um, the I'd like to put into the record um, an article from the Wall Street Journal dated October 31st, 2008. Banks owe billions to executives. The first sentence of which reads, financial giants getting injections of federal cash owed their executives more than $40 billion for past year's pay and pensions as of the end of 2007, a Wall Street Journal analysis shows. So it looks to me like that $40 billion, had these institutions gone through a proper bankruptcy, would have been treated as general unsecured claims and would have been haircut very, very significantly. Now, there are a lot of things we could do with $40 billion of taxpayer money around here. I doubt very much that if we were making this decision for ourselves, there'd be much bipartisan support for spending $40 billion in taxpayer money to make sure that highly compensated individuals who deferred their income for tax purposes get that paid back in a bankruptcy. I don't think we'd get a single vote on our side of the aisle, and I doubt we'd get any on your side of the aisle either, Mr. Chairman. So what happened in the TARP is that all that got paid 100 cents on the dollar as a corollary of not having to go through any kind of a bankruptcy procedure. I personally would like to see that that never happens again. That is one of the reasons I'm here today at this hearing. I think there are far better ways to spend $40 billion of the public's money than to make good on highly compensated individuals' tax deferral schemes. But that is the way it worked out because the pressure of trying to salvage the financial system from a complete collapse was so great that we were able to overlook these priorities that generally uh, are protected in the bankruptcy system. So I just came to make that point. I hope that if we proceed on uh, anything like this, that we see to it that this sort of, um, in my view, profligate and disgraceful spending of taxpayer dollars is not repeated. If I might, I'll just ask the panel on that exact point. Um, if there were a Chapter 14 as currently uh, contemplated, um, what priority would be given uh, to senior executive deferred compensation? How would that work out? Professor Rowe, you raised your hand. Um, uh, I was raising my hand for a slightly different point, but um, um, my sense is these would be general unsecured creditors, and they'd get whatever general unsecured creditors do get in the, uh, in the proceeding. And in these but, specific cases, it would have been zero. Okay. Um, the... The, uh, the suggestion that I wanted, that I wanted to put on the table, uh, it's not so much for this bill, but for general policy purposes, that's in the spirit of your comment. Uh, one thing to consider is whether, um, uh, if this goes forward, we have this big slug of debt that will be turned into equity and money lost um, over, this, over this weekend. Um, there might be some very beneficial, there would be some very beneficial incentive effects if senior executives at the financial institutions that we're talking about um, held as part of their compensation, um, not so much stock in the company, but this debt um, that would disappear and take a very big hit if the institution fails. Now, managing that and figuring out how to implement it is going to be a complicated thing that can't be done here, but the general principle um, could improve the financial safety of, uh, of the United States, make the clear, executives the, the ones... In the right direction for executives to be more prudent and not take the kind of wild risks and bets that tank their companies. Um, that's right. They, if they had to hold um, low-level uh, debt 
that is, uh, um, uh, loses significant value when the bank fails. Uh, to the extent incentives are critical and they're part of the story, I tend to think that uh, integrity and competence are more important than incentives here. But to the extent incentives are a significant part of the story, um, it would be good to work on the incentives so that the incentives match uh, the, uh, the well-being of the American economy. May I add something to that? Let me just unpack for a moment. Under existing Chapter 11, which would not be disturbed by Chapter 14 on this point, with regard to compensation for executives. As an initial matter, under the most recent significant round of bankruptcy code revisions, which were in 2005, let's, let's take different pieces of compensation. Severance for executives is now effectively impossible to get court approval for. There's a very, very, very narrow provision that exists under Chapter 11, and it can never get satisfied. So executives never get severance in bankruptcy. With regard to bonuses that executives may get in bankruptcy, critical pieces that need to be un, uh, aware of on this. First of all, Chapter 11 has a heightened standard for insiders to get bonuses, as opposed to non-insiders to get bonuses. So there's already a heightened standard under Chapter 11. Chapter 14 does nothing to impact that. Secondly, something that uh, gets overlooked, I think, is there's no automatic right to compensation for executives post Chapter 11 filing. The debtor has to make a motion to get that approved. All creditors have the ability to object and show up and make their arguments, and it has to be approved by the court. So I do think sometimes there's a perception that if there are bonus programs in place, a company files for Chapter 11, and the executives all just get what they otherwise would have received, and that's simply not the case. It absolutely needs to be argued before the court, and nothing can get paid, even under the heightened standard, unless the bankruptcy judge approves it, and again, Chapter 14 does nothing to disturb that heightened standard under Chapter 11. But TARP blew through all of that and funded them all 100 cents on the dollar. Yes, and some of those uh, recipients of the TARP money didn't file. So in a different circumstance there, they didn't have to get bankruptcy court approval. Mr. But even, Bernstein. sorry. Sorry, Mr. Bernstein. So I, I would add only one thing about this particular bill. The purpose of the bill is to avoid the need for federal money to go into these firms at all. So it, it eliminates at, at sort of at the gate the possibility that, that um, employees will be compensated with federal money. But that's, the, that's the, one of the points of the bill is to accomplish that result. Let me ask two more questions, if I may. Let me just ask of all of you, um, in, in your view, would the availability of Chapter 14 uh, enhanced bankruptcy encourage banks to engage in riskier activities than they might otherwise? In one dimension, yes, um, in that Chapter 14 does upgrade the uh, uh, payability of, the, of repos and derivatives in that the transfer mechanism requires some uh, findings that these will be paid for, for sure. Other than that, um, I don't think so. Um, I think this uh, may even go the other way in all other respects. And, and the related question, would it increase or decrease the likelihood of publicly funded bailouts in the future to have Chapter 14 as a complement to Title II OLA? Uh, certainly if it works as planned, as it, if it works the way we hope it will work, it should reduce the need for, or the, it should reduce any public funding. Right. Um, I, I mean, I, if, it works, if it works properly, the bank reopens on Monday, People see that it's now been recapitalized, have enough confidence in it that they continue to do business with the bank, uh, and the bank is the bank no is stable, money goes and in. no public money goes in. Right. Uh, if it doesn't reopen in a stable way, we have a different problem. Right. Um, so I, 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 I think I differ slightly from Professor Rowe on, on the issue of the incentives. Um, first of all, with the private sector absorbing the losses, the private sector will engage in much heavier monitoring activity. Hmm of the firms, so they don't, they don't believe that they have a public sector bailout behind them, and they will therefore make sure that the banks are engaging in appropriate activity or the bank's cost of funding will go up. So that's one, one thing. The second thing on the financial contracts, um, while it appears that there may be a, a, a provision in, in this statute that permits the financial contracts to ride through, what they would otherwise do is terminate. They would probably be paid almost entirely in full by using collateral, and there would be less value for everybody else. So uh, in addition, most of those contracts are at the operating level. They're not at the holding company level. So I don't think, as, a, as, a, as an actual matter, they're being advantaged by removing their ability to close out. And in fact, when this was proposed to the market, 
the market, uh, uh, the counterparties all reacted very negatively because they thought they were giving something up to the banks. So, so in fact, I think it, it really doesn't even uh, have a negative impact by improving the position of the financial contract counterparties. Thank you, Mr. Hess. Yeah, if I can comment quickly on both, with regard, does it, it does it provide an incentive to engage in risky behavior? Absolutely not. I think it's a significant disincentive. Um, in my experience, overwhelmingly, the most critical factor that determines between a soft landing and a hard landing in a Chapter 11 filing is time to plan. It's the earlier that management and the directors and officers start working with advisors to prepare for a potential Chapter 11 filing. Ideally, corporations the size of these major banks, you'd have months on end to do that. And engaging in that responsible pre-petition planning, that is encouraged by Chapter 14 supplementing Chapter 11 because it, it maintains the existing Chapter 11 like orderly process. I would say Title II, while useful as an effective backstop, Title II comes in and clears out all the directors and officers. And so logically, if you're the DNO of a major bank and it starts to approach insolvency, if the likelihood is a Title II proceeding, I think you actually have even more incentive to continue to throw Hail Mary after Hail Mary and do everything possible, regardless of how risky it may be, to avoid an insolvency proceeding because you're out. You're gonna get cleaned out and all your compensation is immediately, immediately getting clawed back. So I think it actually provides the disincentive, which chapter 14 as supplementing 11, if there is the prospect of having a soft landing and an orderly reorganization that maximizes value for stakeholders, I think it encourages that careful planning. And then secondly, with regard to publicly funded bailouts, again, because there, there, um, because there are mechanisms within Title II that allow for political discretion, that allow for regulators as directed by whatever administration is currently in place to potentially favor whatever types of constituencies they may want to favor, I think that actually increases the likelihood that if funding is needed, that an administration, in order to take care of favored constituencies, may turn the spigot back on for public funding, even though it's ostensibly barred right now under Title II. Chapter 11 slash Chapter 14 has nothing with regard to any specific provision for government funding. A debtor could go ask the federal government to be a debtor in possession lender. The government could just simply say no, but the debtor could do that now. Um, but because there's no grants of political discretion inherent in Chapter 11 slash 14, I think it's actually much less likely that the government would be a lender and provide bailout money. Thank you for your answers, and thank you, if I could, to the panel. Professor Rover, you had something you wanted to add? Uh, sure. I wanted to add something. Before we walk away um, with the sense that Chapter 14 really makes uh, sure that we've got appropriate respect for priorities and uh, creditor equality, um, there are some provisions that are, gonna, that are in the bill that will change that. Um, I think, for the most part, they're positive, but we should put that on, on the table. Um, so there are exemptions in the bill for intercorporate transfers in the financial institution in the three months before bankruptcy, which normally could be recalled if they favored one creditor over the other. Um, and the concept is uh, if, the, if the institution has limited resources, we want the resources going to the systemically most important uh, places. Uh, now that will be favoring one creditor over the other. I think it's probably a beneficial favoring of one creditor over the other, but it is favoring one creditor over the other. Uh, there is something that uh, at some point we got to focus on in making the bill, making sure the bill works. The um, exemption from recalling the favored payments uh, doesn't require that the payments go to the systemically most important place. If management makes a mistake or has some incentive to put it to take it out of the systemically most important and put it in uh, a systemically less important place for whatever reason, it's also protected. Uh, and that's probably something we want to think about because I think the, the goal is a good one. Um, the implementation probably needs a little bit more thinking. Just, just 10 seconds on that, if I may. The one thing to be clear on that, though, is it is the transfer, to, it's post transfer that those intercompany payments would otherwise be protected. The transfer itself is still subject to bankruptcy court approval, also. So it's a narrow window, it's only 48 hours, but there is an opportunity pre transfer to challenge those payments, to challenge the enforceability of those payments. It still does need to be signed off on by a judge. Senator Kuhn, Senator yeah. Whitehouse, any other questions? I, I think that's not correct. Um, uh, the, the transfer is done. In the 90 days before bankruptcy, uh, which under normal bankruptcy practice could be recalled, um, are protected under the, in this bill. Um, and if the transfers are moving assets from a challenged company from, that's, that has um, uh, from its systemically less important places to its systemically more important places, 
this is a valuable thing to have. Uh, the problem is if it goes the other way around. Well, gentlemen, thank you for your uh, time and expertise helping us try to figure this out and make uh, an incremental, although I think important improvement in this process. Um, we are going to adjourn the hearing in a moment, but uh, we will uh, leave the record open for a week for senators who weren't able to be here today. If they have written questions they'd like to submit to you, um, we'll ask them to do that within a week. And if you would please respond to those so we can then close out the record and move the, this process forward. Thank you very much. Hearing is adjourned.